we have the green light to start rolling it out across the country. The first doses of our guaranteed 40 million dose. Tonight, another vaccine is on the way. Have a culture that's going to be affected by it the most. And concerns over the Alaska to Alberta railway. Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Today, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau offered some encouraging news about another COVID-19 vaccine, one that appears to be easier to roll out to remote communities. Jamie Pashagumskum has more. It's official. Canada has a second vaccine on the way. Now that Health Canada has approved the Moderna vaccine, we have the green light to start rolling it out across the country. The first doses of our guaranteed 40 million dose order from Moderna will arrive in the coming days. Along with the Pfizer vaccine that began arriving earlier this month, Canada is on track to receive a combined 1.2 million vaccine doses by the end of January. Dr. Howard New said 240,000 Pfizer vaccine doses have now been distributed to provinces and certain groups remain a priority. We will continue to follow the evidence-based recommendations of the National Advisory Committee on Immunization on the need for early vaccination to priority groups, including frontline healthcare workers, residents and workers in long-term care facilities, as well as Indigenous peoples who are at risk of being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Major General Danny Forte is in charge of transportation of COVID-19 vaccines. He says the Moderna next... vaccine is easier to transport than the fragile Pfizer vaccine and has a longer shelf life. We're building capacity and collaborating with our federal, provincial, territorial and indigenous partners to ensure that as many Canadians as possible can be safely immunized against COVID-19 and as quickly as possible. Chief Medical Officer for Indigenous Services Tom Wong says he remains concerned over increasing cases on First Nation communities. And getting the Moderna vaccine to Indigenous communities will be a high priority. We are taking deliberate steps to ensure the safe, efficient and equitable distribution of the COVID-19 vaccines across Canada, especially into the territories, Indigenous, isolated and remote communities and impoverished urban Indigenous settings. With the Moderna vaccine scheduled to arrive on December 28, Trudeau says we're not out of the woods yet and people need to stay apart and safe over the Christmas holidays. Jamie Pashagumska, APTN National News, Ottawa. The Yukon government says it's expecting its first delivery of Moderna, va Moderna vaccine by the end of this month. In January, 7,200 doses will be distributed to the territorial government. That's enough to vaccinate 3,200 people. With a population of 35,000 people, the Yukon is expected to receive around 50,000 vaccine doses, which would cover the required two doses for 75% of the population by early 2021. Yesterday, territorial officials said that the vaccine could be shipped to the territory within as little as 48 hours. Our teams have been dedicating themselves to ensuring success with the vaccine strategy. And each day we become more prepared for the arrival of vaccines in Yukon. 2021 will start off positively as vaccines arrive and as we continue preparations to get vaccines into the arms of as many people as possible. A proposed railway connecting Alaska to Alberta is currently in consultation with Canadian stakeholders and could be soon be a reality. While its supporters say the line will bring a much-needed financial boost to Canada, critics in the Yukon argue it'll destroy the environment and encroach on First Nations. Sarah Connor ex explains. This map shows a proposed railway line that would connect Alaska to Alberta by 2025. The A2A is a $22 billion freight rail project that would travel from Fort McMurray to Anchorage's deep water ports. It would move oil, container goods and passengers. I'm totally against the railroad. Ann Mies is from Selkirk First Nation in the Yukon and works for the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society's Yukon branch. She says much of the 2,500-kilometre railway will pass through the Yukon and Northwest Territories, and she's concerned that it will cause major environmental damage, disrupting waterways and traditional hunting grounds. Now, we rely a lot on moose. Um, the moose population will likely decrease. And I said we don't know how many waterways they'll go through. 
While the exact route is still being planned, the Wilderness Society figures the A2A could go through as many as five First Nations territories in the Yukon, including Mises. We have our culture that's going to be affected by it the most because we're going to have to change our way of thinking to accommodate a project that is new to us. John Curtis has a master's degree in environmental policy. A few weeks ago, he started a petition against the railway, which already has over 350 signatures. He says that the rail line will move oil while avoiding British Columbia, where there's heavy resistance to pipelines and rail transport. They're looking at transporting up to 2 million barrels of oil a day. And no wonder they're being silent about that. Yukon government declared a climate emergency, and that would be a climate disaster. A2A has promised over $100 million in environmental assessments and vigorous consultation with some indigenous groups, including rerouting if First Nations disapprove. But Curtis is still skeptical. You can't. Uh, there, there are First Nations all throughout the Yukon and Northwest Territories. I don't see how that would be possible. I really would like to see this project move forward uh, to the benefit of everybody. Michael Cram is a Conservative MP from Saskatchewan and an A2A advocate. He says it's much needed in the prairies because of frequent backlogs of wheat, oil and potash. Any time that we can build either a pipeline or a railway or some other type of infrastructure to get goods moving, that's always a good thing for the landlocked provinces. Cram says A2A expects 28,000 jobs to be created by 2040 and that there's economic benefits for northerners. You know, right now, foodstuffs have to be flown into uh, uh, to, you know, the north and that uh, can be very expensive. If foodstuffs and other products can be brought in by rail, the price goes down and everyone will have more money in their pockets left over. A2A has already secured approval from President Trump to start building in Alaska and is currently in the consultation phase with Canada, which could take years to complete. But for Anne Mees, there's no price tag high enough that can be put on the land. For what the dollar is worth, um, the destruction is going to be three times that dollar. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. An Inuit organization in Yellowknife is looking to spread holiday cheer while tackling food insecurity. Charlotte Moore Jacobs has more. It's like Santa's workshop, but the stakes are higher. As the Yellowknife moot, Inuit Katagi Katagi tackle food insecurity, one hamper at a time. One of the missions of the organization is to provide food security for Inuit in town. Uh, there are a lot of like economic challenges in accessing like fresh foods um, and nutrient-rich foods, especially during a time of COVID where people have lost their jobs um, and are struggling financially. Coordinator Tanya Roach says the 65 hampers going to Inuit families in Yellowknife will do more than put food in the cupboards. I always found that when I like I go visit an Inuk person, they're often like cooking or there's food on the table and it's like come and eat. It's it's a very relaxing way for us to just sit and enjoy each other's company. Typically folks would gather for a Christmas feast. That won't happen this year. With COVID-19 restrictions, the nonprofit is pivoting to help those who need it most. Dakota Sarzwick and her mom, Valerie Kimixana, are thankful for the hamper. Can you give a smile from that neck? Dakota is 22 and a new mom to a three-month-old daughter. She herself is getting to know her Inuvialuit roots, reconnecting with mom after many years. Over the country foods Yellowknife Moot has provided is greatly welcomed. My adopted family didn't like country food at all. They didn't like caribou, they didn't like char, and I'd like her to grow up with all that kind of good stuff, because I'm not, like, I'm not used to eating our country food, right? Kim Xana says Inuit diet has changed since she grew up in Tukta Northwest Territories. And even though food is cheaper in Yellowknife, it's financially challenging for Inuit in the city. Paying the rent, exactly. you have very little for food or for bills, for that matter. Yeah, so, so, fifteen hundred dollars a month is a lot of money. So many bananas. But the gift of giving isn't limited to the holidays. So we're a pretty new organization, but we have the intention of growing 
as big and wide as we could. So that inc includes like social welfare, uh, financial assistance for post-secondary education, being a resource center for Inuit in town looking to progress their lives forward. The Yellowknife Loot say they hope to make hampers a regular occurrence and provide Canadians with food for thought on the reality of food insecurity beyond the Christmas break. Charlotte Mort Jacobs, APTN National News, Yellowknife. It's time for a break, but here's some of APTN's winter solstice Indigenous Day Live. Welcome back. Award-winning filmmaker and director Michelle Latimer has claimed Métis and Algonquin heritage throughout her career, but that identi identity is now being questioned by members of the Indigenous film and entertainment industry. Some of them are saying that Latimer's self-identification isn't true. Tamara Pimentel has more. It is not an easy time to be Indigenous. Michelle Latimer gives an acceptance speech in 2018 after Vice Production Rise won a Canadian Screen Award for Best Documentary Program. Over the last week, there have been questions around Latimer's Indigenous identity after a National Film Board media release stated Latimer is of Algonquin, Métis and French heritage from Kitagon Zibi in Quebec. Vladimir said on Facebook, I made a mistake in naming Kitagun Zibi as my family's community before doing the work to formally verify. People in the Indigenous media and entertainment industry have been speaking up. Author and actor Gitz Durange was a host for Rise and worked closely with Vladimir. For us that have, have been duped, for us that have bought into that false image that she was portraying, um, it's, it, it's, you feel so used. Like, I feel like my, my skin color and my ancestral line was weaponized to further her career. Vladimir has since resigned from the second season of Trickster, and the National Film Board is pulling her documentary, Inconvenient Indian, from distribution. It won't be playing at the Sundance Film Festival. Vladimir's claim of identity sparked outrage on social media. Heisla novelist Eden Robinson, on whose novel the Trickster series is based, took to Facebook. I feel like such a dupe. I don't know how to deal with the anger, disappointment and stress. Inuk filmmaker Alethea Arnakak Burrell wrote, Michelle, I call on you to return your Doc Vanguard Award. The Documentary Organization of Canada says Vladimir has agreed to return the award, which was presented to her early December. Dranje says Vladimir has robbed other Indigenous talent of opportunities. We want to see ourselves succeed, people from our nation. And then when this happens, they rob us of that. They, they just take our stories, and they've always done that. They've, they've always taken our stories. They've always retold our stories. They rob us from these moments. APTN National News has not been able to reach Vladimir for direct comment, but she has issued public statements taking responsibility for not being clear enough about her heritage. One media outlet is reporting that she has retained legal counsel. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Calgary. Gitz Durange, who you just saw in that story, is a Blackfoot Dene author, actor, activist, and youth educator. And he joins us to unpack some of the fallout from working with someone whose Indigenous claims are under fire. So this, of course, isn't a, a comfortable or pleasant topic. you would made a social media post talking about uh, working with Michelle Latter after, um, after the story broke last week. You've worked 
uh, with her when she was at Vice for a series called Rise. Um, you'd said in your post, you know, I thought it was cool that there's a series led by an indigenous woman with Vice, uh, but what made it to air, you wrote, disgusted you. Um, you said that you don't know how to move on from this experience. So can you explain, like, what's going on for you with this? And I really didn't feel like I did right by them. Like, I was there, I got to see them. And I felt like um, I, I had no creative control over the episode, but I felt like it, contri it contributed to the negative stereotypes of Winnipeg. So the, I mean, you didn't have control over this. I guess that goes back to sort of what everybody's talking about. What made it, what didn't make it to air, what ended up on the cutting room floor is, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but why do you think that the feeling that you got um, as an obviously indigenous man, why w wasn't that what the what would have went to air? Is it because of who's telling the story? It's non-native people telling our stories. It's often poverty porn fodder, you know. And you can look at something like Pine Ridge, and it's like every few years, every five or ten years, there's a new poverty porn piece that comes out of Pine Ridge from some non-indigenous person who wins awards and then never goes back. Me and my buddy Mark Tilson, who's uh, Lakota, we often talk about this. Um, if poverty porn could save indigenous peoples, it would already happen decades ago. Yeah. But they like retelling that same story. And that's, I, I believe it's because they don't know any other story about us. They don't really know who we are. You know, this is far from the first person to be uh, questioned about claims to an indigenous identity, you know, or, or calling upon an ancestor back to the 1700s or the 1600s as their claim to being indigenous today. This, this isn't new, but why is there still so much pain and disappointment and sadness and anger when, when it's revealed that that's what's going on? I've just noticed in the last few years that it's easier for a non-native person to claim indigenous ancestry and be accepted than it is for our black indigenous brothers and sisters and family to be recognized as black indigenous or indigenous and accepted than it is for, for these non-native, these white people to come in. And we allow them in our spaces. And I don't know if we're holding them accountable enough. I don't know if we are challenging them enough. I don't know if they know that there's going to be a severe consequence. Um, and. Some people are just fine coming in and telling the story and never coming back to the community, never helping out, extrapolating whatever information, whatever they want from us, and then never coming back. And I only, I really believe the only way that this will change is if there's more, if we start hitting them in their purses and their pockets, you know, um, the, the places that have awarded them, um, you know, recognition, grants, if they start asking for all that stuff back, you know, if we, we took back the awards and we took back the money, mm -hmm. I think that then they'll know and then they'll start to understand that there's a heavy price to pay. But right now we're not seeing it. Right now it's just, you get some, some shaming from us indigenous folks. Mm -hmm. You get some indigenous apologists who are like, why don't you just make space for them? They might not have known any better or they might be a little crazy. Um, and we should just let them be. But the reality is, is that they're robbing us, indigenous peoples, of our opportunities to really succeed you know, like to really break those barriers. And there's more than enough talented people out there who are, who can write better, who can direct better, who can produce better than her, than, than, than Michelle. And they're denied these things over and over again. And who's taking their spots? People like Michelle, people like Joseph Boyden, you know, they, they're just robbing us of our potential. Lots to chew on. And I guess all we can do at this point is see if there's going to be change that goes in that direction. Thank you for taking the time to, to lay those points out for us. Thank you. Since the CBC broke a story a week ago casting doubt on Michelle Latimer's Indigenous claims, she has resigned from the CBC show Trickster and in a statement has said that she continues to research her ancestry. We have to take another break. Here's another highlight from APTN's Indigenous Day Live Winter Solstice. With Christmas so close, young Arishel from Winnipeg, Manitoba is getting into the holiday spirit. 
Looks like she's looking out for Santa and his reindeer, who of course have been deemed essential workers by health officials. I'm not seeing that picture. There we go. Um, yeah, look at, that's a pretty good lookout point there too. Cute little hands. If you've got a great photo, send it to us at share at aptn.ca and you could be our photo of the day. Uh, and here is a look at tomorrow's weather. East Coast, we got minus one in sunshine for St. John's, four and sunshine for Charlottetown. La Grande River, minus nine in snow. Nooks Rock, minus 24 in sunshine. Montreal, nine in rain. Shibugamu, four in snow. Ottawa, eight and cloudy skies. Snow, minus seven for Sault Ste. Marie. Cap is casing, minus 7 in snow, minus 20 with a mix of sun and cloud for Sioux Lookout. God's Lake, minus 22 in snow, Puckettawaga, minus 15 in snow. Sunshine and minus 20 for Winnipeg, minus 15 in sunny for Brandon. 2 in sunshine for Swift Current, 0 for North Battleford and Saskatoon, cloudy skies there. 0 in sunshine for Buffalo Narrows, minus 6 in snow for Stony Rapids. Minus 16 and cloud for Fort Chip, 2 and a mix of sun and cloud for Grand Prairie. Seven in sunny skies for Calgary, five in sunshine for Medicine Hat. Sunny in southern BC, two minus two for Kamloops, five for Campbell River. Minus seven in sunshine for Fort Nelson, minus one in snow for Smithers. Whitehorse minus one and snow, minus 24 in clear skies for Beaver Creek. Norman Wells minus nine, snow, minus 18 in sunshine for Fort Simpson. Polytech minus 21 and snow, Tuck 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 minus 16. Minus 28 in snow for Baker Lake, minus 30 in clear for Cambridge Bay. Igloo Lake, minus 32 in clear skies. Tally Oak, minus 30 in clear. The Winnipeg Aboriginal Film Festival will be taking its 2020 event online this year. The six-day festival begins December 27th and runs through New Year's Day. The festival is the third largest in the world, dedicated to showcasing new Indigenous films across Canada and the U.S. 40 films will be available on demand throughout the online event for viewing. The event will also feature a variety of live streams through the 60s with actors and directors from films engaging with the audience. Each film is available to rent individually or you can purchase a weekend pass that includes all 40 movies. Today was the last in focus of the year, and we capped off 2020 with a Christmas extravaganza. Musical performances by Matt Mack and Rhonda Head, dancing Grinches, bird watching, and some of the best jigging this side of the Red River. Mikey Harris and his sister Sierra, brother Jacob, and are their TikTok sensations from Winnipeg. They have over 400,000 followers. Here's why. So like we'll just be out somewhere, and for example, I went to Dollarama, and my mom asked me to go to Dollarama to go see things. <laughs> And I was like, you know what, let's film in this aisle right now. And I literally just put up the camera and started dancing. So that's kind of like a lot of how we do is or we'll be driving down Portage and see a spot that would we'll be like, we're going to film there. So that's kind of like how it comes about. Yeah. Like pop-up dancing. And so what are people, what's the reaction when there's people around you as you just break out into jigging? <laughs> so like we have been like... When I was in Dollarama, I, I waited for people to just leave, kind of thing, <laughs> you know, because I, I wasn't sure how people would react, but, you know, we did the fork, and, you know, people kind of stopped and watched, and actually, we did one in Osborne Village, and there was a, a person that started screaming out of her window, saying, yeah, yeah, <laughs> so it was a really good feeling, and, you know, it's, it's, it's cool, and it's just honestly such a blessing, especially throughout this time, you know. Um, I was going through a tough time with like just you know creatively because um, mm. I've, I've always danced and dance has always been a part of my life and you know when I started uploading on TikTok and you know people started like seeing it and it kind of blew up it kind of gave me um, inspiration and motivation to keep going and um, kind of let me know that I'm on the right track so it feels really good and uh, I just feel really blessed. Love them so much. That is your Eve of Christmas Eve news. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Have a great night.